from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everyone. I'm Tomoko Steen. I'm a research specialist at Science, Technology, and Business Division of the Library of Congress. Can you hear me over there? OK. Today, we have a fortunate to have the distinguished immunogeneticist and the author, Professor Jan Klein. Professor Klein is the director emeritus of the Max Planck Society for the Advancement of Science. and uh, Francis R. Helen and M. Peretz, visit, uh, M. Peretz visiting professor of science at the Department of Biology. So these long names, it's hard to say. Um, it's at the Pennsylvania State University. So Pro Professor Klein has published many books, and uh, the books are in a way, so you're going to see in the back of the room. And uh, this is um, actually the latest book he published and the biography of Mendel. Professor Klein came same region of the Mendel. So he had the advantage of the reading original script of the, his uh, Mendel's work as well as the, he's a geneticist. So this is a wonderful, very comprehensive, most comprehensive biography, intellectual biography of the Mendel. And the illustration for this book was done by uh, Norman Klein, who's joined us today. And uh, his illustration, his original work is in the back of the room. So you can enjoy the sum of the pieces. And the book is published as a hard copy and also ebook. So, you know, the modern technology. So you can access from your desktop uh, to his book as, as long as you have a little bit of fee to pay. Anyway, um, we would like to uh, just to have a not long interaction, but we'd like to have a lot of slides here and have a wonderful talk and explain about this book by Professor Jan Klein. So before further ado, please join me to welcome Dr. Klein. Many things I forgot was, was my watch. So, I, and Tomoko said I cannot be five seconds longer than <laughs> specified. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, very honored by the invitation and the possibility to present uh, uh, Norman and I the book that we have been working on for uh, some years now. And uh, Norman already thought that it might never appear and was very surprised that it actually it did. So, But it's only the first volume, and we still have to, f to write the second. So uh, anyway, I will concentrate on, on the first volume. Not exclusively, but I will give you a preview of what you might expect in the second volume. Uh, the book looks like this. I consider it horrible, but uh, Springer Verlag insisted that that's the best that they can do. and. Uh, well, they had the last last word, uh, and uh, 
but uh, hopefully it will appear also in Czech translation, so <laughs> those of you who know Czech, you might, might get the better version of the, the, of the book. Anyway, inside are many illustrations, and uh, so, uh, and most of them are okay, but uh, also not ideally done. So, since I am not not a historian, I uh, think I should uh, explain uh, what was uh, why I wrote the book. And so I will start with motivation. I have known about Mendel for a long time, but uh, more or less secretly because uh, at when I was studying at the gymnasium uh, Mendel was a persona non grata in, uh, in Czech uh, Republic so uh, but I knew that he was born somewhere close to, to my, where I was born so I as a as a boy actually made a bicycle trip uh, to that area and I and since that time, I, w I was thinking about Mendel a lot. Uh, then, but there were other reasons. So, uh, to r for t making the decision of writing the, the book, and that was that uh, whenever w there are many articles and many books, and then most of the time when I read something, I uh, there are many inaccuracies and misinterpretations almost always practically that uh, because the people have trouble with, uh, with the Czech uh, with the uh, German uh, language and, and and so on so uh, I can you give me an article and I, t I tell you uh, what's wrong with it uh, and uh, so I had the uh, ambition to to write it without this uh, the, these problems um, as I said the, the the place where Mendel was born had a great uh, impact on me and uh, I don't know whether you understand that when you come to an area and you you feel something that uh, is in as a spirit or something, so it's uh, you know the Romans uh, had uh, a name for it. Uh, gen uh, I had it here. G uh, what is it? Huh? Gen genius. <laughs> Genius Lotsi, genius Lotsi, uh, but that meant that the, the, they had a spirit, uh, like d divi uh, divine spirit there, uh, which uh, was uh, influencing the people and uh, and the, the fates of the people. So, so the, the, there is something for me at least. If you go and and sit uh, on on the hill above uh, Hinchitze, uh, <coughs> that is special. And uh, the, and the same happens when you go to Brno and and go to the places. So, so this was kind of irrational reason for my working on on this. And uh, of course, uh, the big. Uh, uh, factor in, in the decision to write the book that, that uh, I had an artist in the family and uh, Norman agreed that he would uh, uh, illustrate the book <coughs> because there are many uh, illustrations uh, that go from one, one paper or one book to another uh, concerning Mendel and it's it's uh, the quality is often declining. So here you have uh, uh, at least, uh, I mean, they are based on authentic original uh, pictures and, and photographs, 
but a new, new interpretation. And that becomes important, especially with uh, uh, portraits of the people, where Norman has uh, often captured the, uh, the spirit of the per person as just exactly as I, I saw it. So it helped. So what are my quali qualifications? Like I said, I was, a, or, or what Tomoko already said, I was born and grew up on a farm that was uh, in, a, in a village that was about, oh, about 30, 40 kilometers from Hinchitze. So uh, the region was very familiar to me and uh, second, uh, also my childhood experiences were probably very similar to those of uh, young uh, Mendel. So uh, not many, I think, uh, biographers of Mendel have a similar experience. Oh, here is the genius loci. So uh, that was the, the, the my familiarity with uh, the uh, area was uh, also I think uh, plus for writing a, a book about Mendel. Uh, of course, there are many, uh, many not many books, but uh, many articles. Uh, when I approach about Mendel, when I approach Springer Verlag uh, with the idea, they say, "Well, you know, th that's an old stuff. That there's nothing to write about. Uh, well, new about Mendel." Uh, and they sent me a list of uh, from uh, the internet how many uh, people have already published about uh, about Mendel, and this was a very long list. But they they were they were articles about Mendel, and they were just uh, uh, saying over and over the same same thing. And uh, I thought uh, there are still things that have been that have not been said about Mendel, and that there is. Uh, a good, uh, a good reason to, to write a book. And finally, well, I am Central European, and uh, by, by origin and by, by interest. Uh, once uh, I went, uh, my, my now, my colleague Masato Shinei invited me to dinner and uh, uh, invited uh, some two, two Greeks who were his, his students, and they told me then that uh, he said, well, come with me, you know, he is a Central European, and, and you Central Europeans always talk about things that I know nothing about, so, so we went. And uh, so I, uh, I was, uh, had a long interest in philosophy, and, and I speak the languages, so uh, it was, I thought sufficient reason that I, I tried to write something. And uh, this is basically what I already uh, said, so, but uh, I, the, uh, the, the important thing is the, what, what I thought I should uh, focus on. So as I, the early life has not been covered, you, you find in the standard biographies of Mendel, hardly a page or two pages of, of his, about his uh, boyhood and uh, life in, in the village. So, uh, and that's uh, understandable because uh, there is, there are no documents uh, that uh, could be used and, and as any anecdotes and uh, anything about him from that period of time are simply non-existent, but I, uh, I thought that I can reconstruct or uh, revive uh, the, uh, the, the circumstances uh, under which Mendel grew up, uh, because uh, those are uh, circumstances with which, which I am very familiar. And then uh, the other thing that I lack in, 
in uh, biographies of Mendel uh, are how how he fits in into the history. I mean, again, you well, you find uh, an, at most an an uh, paragraph about that, but uh, um, not at all, in my opinion, sufficient. And there are some scholarly articles about it, and uh, but I thought it should be also pointed out in in uh, a general biography of Mendel. And and of course <coughs> there are <coughs> many controversies, uh, surprisingly perhaps, um, about uh, in Mendel's life. Uh, and uh, I have some opinions. Uh, also about this, these matters, so I thought uh, that uh, I can contribute perhaps a little bit there too. The controversies, however, are those that I will today be able only to touch on because uh, uh, they uh, are the subject of the se second volume and uh, but uh, at least some of them I will, I will mention uh, if I have time. Um, so here is the outline. Here is the the volume one that uh, you will see in the, in the back. There are, it has six chapters, and these are the the subjects that the, the chapters can cover. Basically, it's a it's a period of his life from uh, from his birth to the to uh, about 1856 when he started his his famous exper experiments and uh, the volume 2 then will be will have an philosophical introduction again and in this uh, so in the first volume it will be the in the prelude it will be uh, the Aristotle and in the in the second volume it will be the natur philosophy uh, time uh, uh, in the time of Mendel uh, so uh, Fichte and uh, and Schelling and and Hegel and, and so on. And uh, so this is the, this is the outline. You can you can see that, and, uh, <coughs> and we come. So we come to Mendel. So what what did Mendel study? This the slide, please, because you have to remember it. I will point out uh, uh, what are the the, the points. Um, the it's the the. Conundrum is the, uh, uh, the saying "like begets life," and so that's the uh, the subject that that uh, people have been interested in since uh, uh, they could uh, they were interested in nature, and and uh, so. And so let's start with with, with uh, an intro uh, as an introduction. Start with uh, what uh, what is the view today? And this is Norman's uh, interpretation of what are the basic features of of uh, life uh, beget begetting life. The the, the age old problem is. Uh, um, concerns three areas, uh, three major uh, subjects, sex, species, and heredity. So uh, in the slide, there are, there are four individuals uh, uh, that, that uh, obviously belong to the same species. They share some uh, some features, uh, characters, and differ in, in others. 
and uh, so the the shared characters define them as, as members of Homo sapiens, so human species, and uh, the differentiating characters define them stages of development. There are three <coughs> adults and one baby, so uh, an immature individual, so they are uh, represent, so they uh, they differ in some characters because of the stage of development. Uh, the, the similarities uh, indicate that have been generated, right, the individuals have been pr the products of uh, sexual reproduction and uh, the differences in indicate that the two individuals of the different six sexes have, have to produce the, the new in the individual. The few differences represent uh, a species variation, so they are not, if you saw that the one characteristic in which they differ is, is was the shape of the, of the nose. And uh, so the inter interpretation is uh, that the baby, the summary is that the baby is the product of sexual reproduction between the two parents, but the sharing of the, the characteristic shape of the nose is either caused by chance or heredity. Now heredity. Here, it's, uh, here is the etymology of, of the word heredity. It has an old origin uh, going to, uh, to the Indo-Europeans and then through Greeks and uh, through, through Latin language and to Middle French and, and to English uh, heredity. But until na uh, 19th century, heredity had a very different uh, heredity had a very different meaning in that uh, it was a legal term actually that uh, it was heredity of uh, something that the uh, predecessor owned and passed uh, on on the on the descendants. It had not biological meaning. And that is sometimes for, forgotten even by Mendel scholars, some of the Mendel scholars, uh, who argue, well, he actually didn't uh, discover, Mendel didn't discover, uh, he's not the founder of genetics because the word heredity doesn't appear in his, uh, uh, in his major work. Of course it doesn't appear because the word was not used at that time or was beginning to be used, but he, he was certainly not yet uh, at that stage that he would need it in writing his, his, his book. So, and the whole, it's not only Mendel who doesn't uh, uh, use the word here, heredity, it's uh, uh, Nobody else before him used heredity in a biological sense, and not even the, the Greeks. And they had, yet they knew all these things that I were de depicted on the on the cartoon, uh, but they didn't uh, have words for it. And why why was that? I think the the main reason is that uh, they. Uh, they didn't uh, need the word because they were interested in uh, in something that uh, they called generation, the sex and uh, species and uh, rep sexual reproduction were put all together under a single word that, that was generation, and that that is uh, you probably cannot read, but it's. Uh, it's a, a regular cycle for any uh, sexually reproducing uh, individual that it goes through 
uh, the production of, uh, of gametes and the gametes then fuse and give rise to a new individual. So the old individual dies and a new individual is born. And that they call generation. And of course part of the generation was also heredity. That, that means uh, heredity f of peculiar in uh, characteristics of parents are being transmitted to uh, to the uh, descendants. So they didn't need, uh, and if you read uh, uh, Greek uh, uh, manuscripts, papers, or, or books from that time, you will not find uh, heredity uh, in use in that sense, the biological sense. So, but uh, as uh, I will argue that uh, they nevertheless had a, a theory or a hypothesis of heredity. And uh, to understand stand that hypothesis, you have to realize that the Greeks, the Greek philosophers, were di divided into two, two camps concerning the underlying uh, principle of, of uh, heredity, and that is uh, change. And the groups were uh, the schools of Parmenides uh, and of Heraclitus. Uh, so one group that was Parmenides argued there is no change. Everything is uh, and nothing changes. Whereas <coughs> the other group, Heraclitus, uh, the representatives uh, argue that everything changes. There is no being. There is only becoming. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the cu culmination of uh, this, this conflict is uh, best uh, shown in the three uh, <coughs> philosophers of the golden age of uh, the Greek philosophy and the Socrates and Plato and uh, Aristotle. I don't like to uh, use the word Plato because uh, um, I thought that historians agreed some time ago that, that names of individuals should be used uh, in the form in which, in the same language uh, as they are pronounced, in, so in this case in, in Greek, uh, how, how they are pronounced, and certainly uh, Greeks don't say Plato, so Plato would be closer, but it's not exactly either, it's the same with Aristotle, so, but uh, so I might be sometimes switches, sw forgetting myself and saying Plato or Plato, but uh, that's uh, the reason. So why, uh, what, what did the uh, old ancient Greeks uh, think of, of uh, change? So the common sense view was that a being, you know, so a thing, A, is, so it exists. The, the second point is that becoming uh, is when thing A changes into thing B. And then they had non concept of non-being, which means thing A is not, it does not exist. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense to us and it made sense to them. But Parmenides uh, was of a, of a different opinion. He says uh, all this is a logi logical nonsense. And his argument is, is briefly here. And it's, it's a little bit a caricature of the argument, but, but the basically the idea is this. A, he says A, or being, is. B, non-being, is not. 
But this statement does not make sense because nothing can be said about something that does not exist. This about nothing. So nothing can be said, said about nothing. And uh, then he says, an A cannot change into B because B cannot arise from nothing and B cannot arise from A because if A contained B, it would not be A. Uh, it sounds like uh, just play with words, but uh, there, uh, there is something to, to that argument. So the conclusion is there is only one being, one thing, in the world, and uh, that one thing is unchangeable. Heraclitus of, of Ephesus uh, thought just the opposite. He said everything is changing, and so, and all the time. So nothing is uh, being that is not changing, because to be is something, it would be f kind of frozen. It would have to be un un unchangeable, but it's that's not the case. So there is no being. There is only change or becoming. Now. I cannot cannot go into the description of uh, how the uh, all the Greek philosophers reacted to these uh, uh, dilemmas, but uh, I will from now on concentrate on Aristotle. Aristotle, because uh, he he took into account all what uh, the his predecessors philosophers. Uh, the opinions that they had, and uh, summarize it, and he is thus a representative of what the, the Greek view of what, what it meant. So, and so we have to find, uh, we have to start with Aristotle's concept of reality if we want to understand what uh, what he thought of of uh, the, the question of generation. So uh, reality is everything that's around us, and uh, he divides it into universals and uh, particulars. I mean, he, this is not original Aristotle. Of course, this, this he took over from, from his predecessors, but uh, uh, the way he used it is Aristotle's own. The uh, universals are things that so now let's say particulars. The particulars is, is, is this, which tells me that I'm running out of time slowly. And uh, uh, any substance that you touch or is, is, is particular. Universal would be watches. This is a watch, and watches is, 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 a, is a universal. So, and then he divides universals. Uh, he says they are, uh, they are species. He calls them then aidos, species, groups of particulars. So this is one particular, and uh, watches are a group of, of uh, particulars. And, uh, and they have, they are the, the, what, what the group has in common, what all the individual things of, of uh, the species of uh, the universal have in common. Uh, and he, but he's, he's, the species are defined by, as, by attributes, the characteristics, and they are, they are the the essentials that, that makes a species. <laughs> that will be tough. Um, so uh, that's, that's uh, and then he says uh, on the, on a, on a, on a, on a species there are also uh, attributes that are or on, on a particulars uh, are 
uh, uh, variable uh, attributes. That the species, what what is what defines the species is the essence, the, the same characteristics that they all share, but the particulars differ in uh, non-essential variables. This uh, is. Uh, this idea is uh, not exactly just uh, Aristotle, but he certainly he uh, uh, certainly made it very clear. Uh, and Plato was also uh, thinking of, of uh, distinguishing between substance and its characteristics, characters. But uh, uh, it was Plato. Uh, who, it was Aristotle who made it uh, very clear. Um, now, Aristotle, uh, later in his life, and part of the reason why uh, he, he had to change his, his uh, classification of reality, and uh, the, the reason was was Parmenides, that, that Parmenides uh, said, well, there are no, no uh, individual things. And uh, Aristotle reacted to that uh, uh, in the following way. He, he took from Plato the distinction between uh, something, uh, well, the universal and the, the particulars. And uh, Plato in Plato's view, the, the universals were uh, not in this, they didn't exist in the, but they were real, but not in this world. Uh, they, they were in transcendental uh, world, world, and uh, whereas the, uh, the uh, particulars were real, in the sense that they were material. So uh, universals were immaterial, uh, particulars were material. And uh, uh, so this came the, to the concept that there are some uh, uh, things somewhere in the transcendental world that are not material and the species concept and the uh, essential forms and everything were in that world that were not in, in from the natural world. Uh, uh, Aristotle t took that over but uh, said, that, uh, okay, but it's not, there are clearly two things in the, wor in the world, uh, but uh, it's not, uh, transcendental versus material, immaterial versus mater uh, material. Uh, he said everything has has some form uh, and uh, also uh, some stable material characteristic. Uh, this is uh, so he had a du dual concept of uh, of reality, and uh, I think this uh, was uh, the reason why why he had to come to the concept of uh, of his generation. So his starting point is dual nature of being, persisting components of the there is a persisting component. So uh, in every thing which is matter, and there is a changing component of the substance which is a form. And then there are what what is changing depending on whether it's substantial or non substantial. And uh, these, uh, the, the non substantial are the, are the attribute that come and go, and, and uh, the substantial are those that uh, are essential for without which the thing would not be the thing that, we, that it is.
This was his philosophical concept of generation. Uh, but Aristotle was not only a philosopher, but he was also he was uh, also a scientist, and uh, he had a biological concept. He did experiments and he uh, tried to explain the biological events that uh, that uh, are un un underlying uh, uh, generation. So, the, the his basic uh, points are there is a assumptions that there is a causal connection between mating and procreation. This to us is obvious, but not to the ancient uh, at all. Uh, he distinguished that the, uh, the male semen originates from, from blood by a series of boilings, so-called boilings, in which the nutrients are extracted from the consumed foodstuff. Uh, responsible for the boiling is a vital heat borne by something he called pneuma, warm air in the blood. The vital heat heat is uh, the quintessentia, the fifth element, and uh, to this day we say quint quintessential, uh, equivalent, equi which is equivalent to the ether pure fresh, fresh air breathed breath, breath by God. So his, uh, he had uh, his essential uh, terms are psychic is the form, it's the same as form, which is associated with matter and which is the sub substance. Pneuma or the is a hot air, which is uh, also part of the sub sub substance. And then there is something called, he called he he vital heat, which is uh, the power that drives uh, the changes and uh, uh, that is uh, what we would today call energy. So how did he explain the, the generation? He said uh, females like males produce something that is becomes involved in in uh, the development of a new individual and he called that katamania that called the, the male element sperma and uh, the female element uh, katamania which is uh, monthly blood flow then he said that the, the, when these two mix, then the mixture he called chimera, and uh, the, his principal point was uh, was that uh, um, when they uh, when they mix, then the male provides the form and the, f the female provides the, uh, the matter. That, of course, became uh, a subject of, uh, of an attack uh, by, by feminists, and uh, justifiably so, because uh, the form is obviously uh, providing all that, that, that seems to matter. And, uh, but this was uh, at, at the time when uh, the, the male chauvinism was uh, a normal thing. So, and then the, the whole development is is driven by uh, by uh, by the pneuma or the vital heat, which is, uh, which is energy. So it, it sounds very, very naive, very primitive, but re in reality it's not very different from what we think about the development today. And uh, 
So Aristotle compares the starting event of an embryo development to the setting of milk under the action of rennet in the production of cheese, like the rennet causing coagulation of the milk in, into curds. The sperma causes the fluid catamenia to solidify in, into body form parts. The male form is an impulse that sets into motion a process that uh, then sends an impulse to another to initiate another process, and so on in a manner of uh, chain reaction. Aristotle compares the series of events to the transfer of movements in a mechanical toy. We don't know what the mechanical toys would look, would look like, but uh, uh, it's, not, it's not very different from the modern concept of, of embryonic evolution, de development, because uh, the, the chemistry and, and everything, uh, the chain reaction the concept and everything is retained to this, to this day. So his view was uh, an epigenetic concept of uh, embryonic development and uh, so gradual successive differentiation of individual parts. And uh, so what was his theory of inheritance? Aristotle does not use the special term like no other uh, ancient ph philosopher. Uh, but uh, has it included into the concept of generation. He distinguished four levels of resemblance between parents and an offspring. Genus level, species level, gender level, and individual level. In principle, the same mechanism of transmission accounts for all four levels of resemblance. The mechanism is actualization of the form. So the in the Imena form and matter come together and then form uh, pushes uh, the development and uh, uh, leads to the actualization of the uh, of the male form in the female matter. The norm uh, the default setting uh, of the development is therefore that offspring should be identical with the father. The form comes from the father, which is uh, all the distinguishing characteristics uh, of the matter. So that comes from the father. So uh, by default, every progeny should be like the father, who so should be male and should be uh, should look like the father in other characteristics. Uh, anything that uh, well, we know that it, it doesn't uh, doesn't uh, happen uh, that we get females and we get uh, as offspring and uh, the, the the offspring uh, resembles parent, uh, the mother. So that anything that does not, that deviates, that is not like the norm, is to him uh, a deviation. So the, the absolute, at the highest level of, of similarity, the, uh, the deviation is a monstrosity. That means that uh, a uh, human being generates uh, uh, get uh, offspring that looks like another species so that's that's a mo ma monster but uh, the but he uh, admit uh, distinguishes and the, the, at the lower levels uh, with what we con consider today as, as uh, the transmission of uh, uh, under heredity is uh, other single characters that uh, 
that uh, distinguish the individuals. Uh, so, in fact, Aristotle distinguishes between phenotypes, that is the characters, and the genotype, which is the substance uh, causing the appearance of the characters. He calls the, the, the substance dynamis and the process leading to the character kinesis. The dynamis is a special vital heat present in the pneuma. Variation in the strength and quality of the vital heat and the interplay with the matter, their interplay with the matter uh, on the maternal side uh, enables uh, Aristotle to explain different deviation from the norm, the change of male to female sex, the inheritance of maternal characters, the reappearance of characters in the, from distant ancestors, and, and so on. Uh, you can sit down, I, I will finish. Preservation and uh, transmission of the uh, Aristotle's legacy, I think we can be uh, familiar with that. It, when it was lost in Europe, Aristotle's works were lost in Europe and uh, uh, saved by, by the uh, today's uh, Arabs. Uh, in Arabian uh, centers of uh, teaching and then was reintroduced to, to Europe and uh, rediscovered. And so uh, what in when, when at the time when Mendel was uh, ready to start his ex experiments, this was was the, what was the view of what we would call today uh, heredity. This was Aristotelian view, and in particular version of the Aristotelian view, which was uh, due to, to one of the uh, scholastics uh, and uh, uh, Tom, uh, Thomas of Aquinas, uh, who but uh, this this was what Mendel was uh, uh, was uh, encountered what Mendel encou encountered uh, when he started to think uh, about uh, heredity. So and and then. Some, something happened that is crucial, I think, to understand Mendel, and that is that uh, uh, there were, in the middle of the 19th century, there were two concepts of what we would call today heredity. One was uh, derived from the old, uh, old uh, generation concept. And the other was Mendel's concept. The, the old one was uh, basically Aristotelian view. That means that uh, what uh, what they what workers like uh, scientists like Darwin and all that uh, after Darwin uh, tried to explain was the mechanism. They didn't uh, necessarily subscribe to the view that, that uh, uh, Aristotle and the Thomists uh, uh, presented, but they, they uh, generated variants of this view. Uh, and uh, everybody, Darwin had uh, theory of pangenesis and then later other many of the same kind, they tried mechanistically to explain uh, development. And that was basically a generation concept of, of, uh, of heredity. And what the major contribution of Mendel is that, that he started a completely different view. 
he was not interested in having a hypothesis, mechanical hypothesis, how to explain uh, transmission of, of, of characters. But he wanted to know the, reg the regularity. I mean, if you read his work, his first, uh, first sentence is that I have been working with uh, plants and uh, breeding plants and trying to produce new variants. And the, it appears uh, when I cross to, to different plants, then I get, uh, I cannot predict what, uh, why, or what will, what kind of variant <coughs> will appear in the progeny. And I believe that there is uh, something that there is some regularity, and I would like to know the laws of these regularities. And that was his major contribution, uh, because uh, uh, it, it was uh, because that was what on what which uh, genetics then then started. So he was uh, when he. Uh, See that that's all you have been spared of. <laughs> okay. Mendel started I mean not everybody agrees with me. The, the, the Mendel scholars scholars. There, there are those who say that he didn't know what he was doing and just just uh, uh, found some by chance some uh, uh, regularities and that uh, later people call those uh, regularities uh, Mendel's laws. But uh, then there are others who say no, he knew what he was doing, and I'm one of them. I, I think it's impossible if you read his work. It's impossible that he. Uh, he didn't have a plan, clear idea what to expect. And the clear idea is, the, is, is this, that there is, well, I, I won't go into explaining. This is a gene, the, the circles are the genes, and the uh, ovals are individuals. These are the, the circles, these circles are, these circles are, are gametes, and you know all that from from high school, so I don't actually need, don't need to explain it. Uh, but Mendel knew this before. He doesn't speci spe specifically say so. He doesn't say anywhere in his in his works that I have this concept of heredity, heredity or something. But he could not have gotten the results, not, not have done the experiments the way he did if he didn't think that this is how, you, how it worked. So, uh, and this is his, uh, his major contribution. And uh, for, for just as to, to uh, think of how he came to this is uh, that it was, he was different from all the others. I mean, uh, uh, Darwin was certainly very uh, successful scientist and uh, very smart and uh, intelligent and so on. But all he could do is to come up with pangenesis, which is completely wrong. And that was because he was still steeped in the old concept of generation and could not think like like Mendel did in, in here. And that is where Mendel's um, greatest achievement lies, and I think that was one of the uh, very greatest uh, discoveries in, in biology. And it's uh, uh, a coincidence that it uh, in, in the, the middle of the 19th century, three 
major discoveries were made that moved, that really founded modern biology. There is one, the first one is Darwin's concept of uh, evolution by natural selection. The second is, uh, is uh, the cell theory, which was, which is generally attributed to uh, Schwamm and Schleiden, but uh, that's completely wrong attribution. I think uh, if you go to the history, you will realize that it was uh, several uh, scientists that, that developed the concept, and but the, the ma main one among them was Jan uh, uh, Evangelista Purkinje. So these three concepts changed our thinking of, of nature, and uh, Mendel is uh, among them. I'm sorry that I got so much of uh, what uh, I planned to do, but it was impossible anyway. It's uh, very difficult to, to explain that. Thank you very much. Uh, we can actually ask a question about uh, the uh, Mendel's life and things. We still have a few minutes for the just the questions. But so we learned a lot about uh, Aristotle, didn't we? And uh, you know, how the inheritance is. Because uh, looking at the Mendel, it's very important to learn the fundamental what came before. So, so do you have any questions, Eric? I didn't Can even include it in, in the... Can you repeat the question? Hmm? Repeat the question. Uh, include it into my presentation because I knew that somebody will ask this question. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I, I think there is no basis anymore, absolutely no basis to, to be... This is what, this is based on on Fisher and uh, Fisher uh, was just uh, uh, in this he was stupid. I'm sorry to say he was stupid. To to and and I'm not the only one who says that. I mean there are geneticists, there are statisticians, uh, and so on who said. But uh, it's I cannot answer than than just uh, this uh, dogmatic way because. Uh, there is a whole book published about just this problem, uh, which gives the, all the, the different uh, mm -hmm. arguments uh, on both sides and comes to the conclu conclusion there is no justification. And I think the, it's just a human nature that we, uh, we have to spoil everything. I mean, the, the, you have to... Uh, he is a good guy, so he cannot be good, right? He, he, has, to, he has to have, there has to be something wrong with, it, uh, with him. So that's one point. And the other is, if, if that would be today, if, uh, uh, you know, or if, if Mendel would have lived, the guys who, who claim this should have been brought to court. And, and provide the evidence, and I think that uh, would have been impossible. There is a question there. It's not a question of fact. I'd like to know, did Jacob Mendel visit England in 1800, where is Darwin's home? Like just finally, I found this out about a few days ago, that there's a certain thing. I didn't quite hear it. Did Mendel visit England in 1862? He did. did he, go, he, down he did visit England, uh, but he didn't visit uh, uh, yeah. da Darwin. He, he didn't go because he didn't speak English. He didn't know English, and I mean, this was this was Mendel. Uh, who am I to go to this big man? And uh, uh, he was humble too. Had he read to Origin of 
species by 1862 prior to his travel? By 1852? 62, I mean, 62, 62. I mean f 59 was, you know, he could, 59 was the, the publication date of, uh, and uh, uh, he could not in, re read it in English, so he read it in German translations, which was a few years later. So that was, that was uh, uh, already when he f finished his, his experiment. So uh, it, uh, the, the argument that he was trying to disprove Mendel, uh, Darwin, uh, this, which is what you are driving at, uh, no, <laughs> okay, but uh, is uh, not based on facts. I mean, he could not have done that because that was, uh, it came later. I, if there are no questions, but, uh, you know, I, I thought I wanted to tell you something about, about uh, the geography and uh, about Czech uh, and the, the area that uh, uh, from which Mendel came from. And so I, uh, one of the things I wanted to tell you that it's, uh, its history is very old and it goes to prehistory. Uh, there were people, Homo erectus, living in that area uh, a long time ago. And uh, this is the, the Venus of Vjestanice. This is uh, 26,000 years old. It's not the original, though. don't try to <laughs> love it. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, the, there was, uh, you know, it's a country with a long history, and I, I wanted to spend a lot of time, uh, some time on why uh, is there uh, a problem with, uh, which is another thing, which is the annoying things to me is when I start, well, Mendel was an Austrian uh, genet geneticist or, or something, which is, Absolutely nonsense. Uh, I mean, he was uh, not Austrian. And Norman has a, I don't know whether you have it on display there, another cartoon uh, where, where some, uh, well, I, it's, it's somewhere there, but uh, where, well, yeah, you will find them all in the book, where he, as he was traveling, you know, in the in Austrian Empire, you had to. Uh, tell you had to go to the police every time you went to Vienna or Brno and, and, and so on. So uh, he, uh, he had to report. And so there is a Norman depicted one of these commissars uh, asking him, uh, asking him, listen, Mendel, uh, what I am actually? Are you, are you Austrian? Are you German? Or even check, and uh, he says, uh, Herr Commissar, I am sh Silesian. And that is really true. I mean, he was, if you want to speak of, of his nationality, he was born in Silesia, in Schlesien, in German, and uh, uh, Slesko in Czech. So uh, this is all wrong. Whenever and, and everybody repeats it uh, in in all articles. It's it's uh, well the variation is that he's a German uh, geneticist or, or but rarely Czech. And there has been argument about this, and it's all wrong. I mean the, he was Silesian by officially by everything. Silesia was was a country uh, that was recognized even by the government of, of the, um, the Austrian emperors. So uh, there, in uh, around 19, almost 1900, there was uh, the Austrian Empire. And one of the princes published uh, all description of, of all the nations that belonged to, that were occupied by 
by the Austrians belonged to the uh, Austrian Empire or Austrian-Hungarian Empire by that time. And one of the books is devoted to Moravia, Moravia and Silesia, separate books recognized. And they, the emperors were crowned by, with the Czech crown, and they, and so, uh, you know, these were independent, not independent, but uh, separately uh, recognized countries of the Austrian Empire. Uh, which happened to, uh, in the area when, where he was born, happened to speak German, so that, that was the basis for calling him a German. I must say the, uh, his ancestors, and there are slides also for that, uh, came from, is where they came from we don't know, but uh, very likely is the possibility that he co came from southern Germany. and. Uh, his, his pedigree goes back to, to 1600 uh, in, in, che in Silesia already, but where they were before is, is not known. But uh, this is the reason that they were born somewhere in, in German speaking. They came from a German speaking uh, area, but not from Austria. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Professor Klein. Um, you, you know, on and on, it's a very interesting story. Um, we were just cataloging this book and uh, we couldn't finish, so I have a copy in the back to uh, people to take a look before you leave. Thank you so much for coming and please join me <laughs> to thank the Professor Jan Klein. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.